Good. Um, welcome, everyone. I think this actually may be the largest alumni event in terms of attendance that we've ever had. I think there are almost 200 people who are joining us from um, around the world. So we've got seven pages of Zoom, um, which is the most I've had in a meeting. Um, obviously, we'd rather be meeting in person. It's a shame we're not all uh, in college this evening, um, but that's not possible. We have about 60 students who are in college across our three main sites. These are young people who don't either they're from overseas and can't get home or they're UK students who don't have homes to go to or can't safely be at home. And so we're housing them. Um, the rest of our students are um, having online tutorials, online lectures, many of them now doing their finals, um, all coping remarkably well, showing uh, very great fortitude um, and calmness in the, the face of the pandemic. And we're proud of them. Uh, we're also very, very pleased and delighted at the level of support uh, and encouragement um, we've had from our community around the world and many of you have been in touch and we're very grateful to all of you. Of course, we look forward to next term um, when the college will reopen. Our students will return, we hope, um, and things we hope will gradually return to normal and we'll, enjoy, we'll all enjoy again that personal contact across intellectual disciplines that is, is what makes Wadham, um, um, what it is. And that's something that we really very much look forward to. And we look forward to seeing many of you again um, in person. But thank you all for joining tonight. We've got a fascinating event. I want to welcome Robert Hannigan, who is in the middle of the second row on my screen. I don't know if he's in the same position for everybody else. Um, we're absolutely delighted that, that Robert has joined us this evening. He uh, studied classics um, at Wadham um, and then had a very distinguished career uh, as a public servant. Uh, he played an important role, um, acknowledged by then Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, in his autobiography, in the securing of peace um, in Northern Ireland. Um, and no doubt in recognition of that, in 2007, he was appointed to the new post of uh, security advisor to the Prime Minister uh, in 2007, as well as head of security intelligence um, and resilience in the Cabinet Office. Um, in 2010, he moved to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as Director General of Defence and Intelligence. And between 2014 and 2017, he was Director of GCHQ, the third great intelligence agency in the United Kingdom, the Signals uh, and uh, Intelligence Agency based in Cheltenham. And amongst his many achievements at GCHQ was the creation of the National Cyber Security Center. Uh, Robert is a senior associate fellow of the Royal United Services Institute, a senior fellow of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard, and an honorary fellow um, of Wadham College. Uh, we're honored by our association with him, and I'm very grateful to him uh, for speaking to us all um, this evening. Robert is going to speak for up to 15 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll then probably ask him a couple of questions about um, uh, what he said, and then we're going to throw it open to all of you. Um, what we're going to ask you to do if you have a question is to raise your hand, and I'm sure all of you know, but let me just repeat for those of you who don't, that if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a tab marked participants, and if you click on that, um, uh, a, a box will come up and in the bottom left hand corner of that box is a blue hand and if you press that the hand will raise and I'll see it um, on my screen and then I'll know who to call for questions. So that's how we're going to organise questions um, uh, when we come to them. But for now I'm going to invite um, Robert um, to speak and we very much look forward to what he has to say. Robert. Well, thank you very much, Ken, uh, and thanks for the welcome uh, and for the invitation to be part of this uh, great experiment for the Wadden diaspora. And I see on the list, you know, friends from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and through Skibbereen to Hong Kong and, and in between. So uh, good morning and evening and afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, it's great, great to be here, even if we can't meet physically. Uh, I um, was reading this afternoon uh, an article by an American psychologist on why we are so exhausted by Zoom. Um, why it is such a chore to do a whole day of Zoom meetings. 
Um, it's quite an interesting, interesting uh, set of observations. So I'm going to try not to add to that because I'm sure a lot of you will have been uh, on Zoom or similar um, platforms for much of the day. And I find these meetings work best when uh, there's an interaction and people can have a discussion. So as Ken says, uh, I won't talk for very long and then we'll open it up for questions. What I wanted to do in just uh, a few minutes was cover three things really. So start with the personal experience, which we're all having at this very moment of technology in the pandemic and some of the problems we're seeing arise uh, out of that, because that's where I spend my time these days on cybersecurity. And then zoom out a bit, if you'll excuse the pun, to um, some of the big issues of technology in the pandemic. So some of the solutions that are being offered, but particularly the um, COVID contact tracing apps, which are much in the news, certainly in the UK and um, other parts of the world are further ahead than we are. And, and some of those on the line may have some observations about using these apps uh, in uh, particularly in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, there are some big privacy implications, but some, some uh, wider um, technology problems with these which I'll just touch on and we might discuss them. And then thirdly, to move right out and, and back to a subject I talked a bit about in Wadden in September, about the technology competition and now conflict, particularly between the US and China, but between the West and China, um, which touches now on the whole relationship between China and the West. And uh, I'd be interested in, in the views of those on the line. I think things have changed in the last six months and the pandemic has certainly changed the political atmosphere on that. So I'm going to cover all of those three in a very short time in the hope that that will um, touch uh, some experience of all our um, alumni with different geographies, backgrounds and subjects uh, and timelines. So let me start with the, the personal and of course for a small minority of people who always work from home and have all the kits and are used to uh, policies for working from home uh, there won't have been a huge change in the way they work. But for the rest of us, uh, what's happened really is that something which would normally take a company or an educational institution months, probably years of planning and major investment, uh, that is to get all its staff work, rem working remotely, has happened uh, in a matter of days. That process has been compressed. Um, we're not just video conferencing and emailing, we're file sharing, streaming, we're educating. Uh, we're ordering um, uh, on a scale we never have before. So e-commerce has just uh, uh, mushroomed in a way that uh, even uh, the best projections would not have uh, um, predicted for the, uh, for the next two or three years. Um, the really interesting social question and policy question, I think, is how much of this will survive and how much of this do we want to survive once the pandemic is over, however we define over. But I, I don't want to dwell on that. We, we might come back to it in questions, what other things that we want to keep doing. Um, but I want to just very briefly talk about some of the downsides of that, because that's where I spend my time. Um, beyond all the practicalities of and difficulties of working from home and doing homeschooling and all the things that, that affect our personal lives, um, in the cyber world, there are some big problems um, presented by this sudden shift, an unplanned shift. And criminals and nation states, but particularly criminals, because that's what most of cyber attacks uh, are, they're criminal, um, have spotted the opportunity. And there are two types of opportunities going on here, and you'll probably see headlines about them. The first is technical vulnerabilities that working from home present to cyber criminals. Um, if you haven't planned to work from home, you know, a lot of people are finding they're plugging into their company networks from home machines, which are probably not well protected, or certainly not as well protected as their official machines. They're using a virtual private networks if they're, if they're conscious of this, but they may be using ones that are suspect or unpatched. And they are possibly using insecure video conferencing, and we might talk about that. I know there was a question on that, so we'll come back to it. But all those things present technical opportunities for attackers. And we've seen a very big spike uh, in criminal and nation state exploitation of those. Um, not an overall increase in cyber malicious activities, but a redirection of it towards COVID because it's an opportunity and that's where crime always goes. The second is um, a human or social engineering impact, which is people um, in, the, in the criminal world realizing that heightened fear and anxiety is ideal for fraud. It's, um, people want information, 
they may be isolated at home, they're locked down, and they may have more time on their hands, which is uh, when they start to look for uh, more information on, on COVID in particular. And so there's been a massive rise right across the world, particularly in the US and in Europe, in fraud, cyber fraud related to COVID. So fake emails from the World Health Organization or from Italian hospitals and medics um, pretending to offer advice, but actually encouraging people to click on a link which then in, infects their computer. Um, and websites that look like, fake websites that look like government help for business um, and bank help for business. These are very professionally produced. There's been a, an exponential rise in those over February, March. Um, and of course, they're there to harvest credentials. So you put in your credentials, and preferably your bank details, uh, to say how you'd like to receive your loan. And uh, at that point, you are uh, essentially handing all over your, your, your private information to fraudsters. Um, and you may have seen quite a lot of publicity about this. Again, it's not an overall rise in volume, but it's a redirection. It's a good, it's a good reminder of how opportunistic criminals and to some extent nation states are in cyber activity. And at the high end, um, and this relates to Oxford in particular, we've seen with the US and UK governments warning that nation states, in particular China, uh, but also Russia and Iran are, are actively targeting academic institutions and pharma companies that are looking uh, to develop vaccines or, or effective treatments for COVID. Um, this isn't new. Um, universities have been attacked um, on a large scale for at least the last eight years, um, and in many cases, much longer than that. And intellectual property has been harvested, and there is no more valuable intellectual property at the moment in the world than something that relates to a vaccine for COVID or an effective treatment. So uh, I know from experience that cybersecurity advice for universities is difficult because academics need to share, that's how they do their work, particularly scientists, um, and their mindset is not a necessarily a security one, which is probably a good thing, but it does make them a particularly rich target for those trying to steal intellectual property. So there are some clear downsides which we will need to iron out, and there are some pretty simple ways of doing so if we're going to make this much of this the new normal. Which brings me on to the upsides, because I think those in the cybersecurity industry are very good at doing the scare tactics and saying everything is terrible. Um, uh, as always, um, the upsides of technology massively outweigh those problems. And as we've seen some of the very uh, interesting material put around by the Wadham alumni team on the development of ventilators, on the Jenner Institute's um, work on, fantastic work on vaccines, it just illustrates there are some big technology solutions out there um, that wouldn't have been available to people in earlier pandemics. So um, the one I want to focus on just for two minutes, uh, and I'm sure we can discuss it in, in more detail, is the idea of apps that will help us to contact trace, to work out you know, who has this and whether we've been in contact with somebody who has it. Um, this this is obviously not a new idea. Human contact tracing has been going on for a very long time. And I think it's worth saying that it has always been very invasive of privacy and it's always been very intrusive. So our colleagues in the US will remember the case of Mary Mallon, the famous case of Typhoid Mary, as she became very unfairly called um, an Irish cook in New York um, who uh, was responsible for a, a series of outbreaks, unwittingly, of, of um, typhoid in um, big family houses in New York because she was moving around and um, cooking for different houses. This was spotted by, a, weirdly, a civil engineer from New York um, called Daniel Soper, who um, simply did some detective work and tried to piece out what were the, the common contacts uh, sitting behind these typhoid outbreaks. Uh, and she was asymptomatic. She never developed um, any serious symptoms, but it had a profound effect on her life, actually, and pretty much uh, wrecked her life. She was 25 years in, in effectively in isolation. So um, it, it's, a, it's an extreme example of uh, the privacy and um, invasiveness of, of contact tracing isn't new. And there are, there are other examples, there are examples in the UK from the 19th century, uh, which are, are, are worth, uh, worth looking at. But um, given that we are now good at creating apps for all sorts of pretty trivial things like, you know, where's the nearest pizzeria or are we passing one as we, as we walk down the street? Uh, I think it, it, was, it was a pretty obvious um, 
leap to think that we might be able to use this at scale to help work out who's been in touch with uh, somebody who is either um, showing symptoms or actually um, tested positive. And a number of countries have, have been ahead on this, have already developed apps, and um, particularly in Singapore and Australia and Hong Kong, there's been a lot of experience and some useful feedback on this. In the UK, uh, for, for those online here, um, we are still trying to develop this. Um, it is, I think it's worth saying it's a huge uh, technical challenge, never mind the privacy, which we'll come back to. This has never really been done before uh, in the way that you, the UK is trying to do it. Um, and that is using a decentralized model uh, with low energy Bluetooth, the type, sort of connection that connects your phone to your uh, iWatch or your Fitbit. Um, we can talk about the two basic models of decentralized versus centralized maybe in, in discussion. They have big implications for privacy, um, but what worries me more is they have big implications for effectiveness. The decentralized one is backed by Apple and Google who know a lot about apps. Um, and uh, bluntly, it is more likely to work. Most countries are going with that model. Um, we're taking quite a big risk by going for the centralized model. Um, it is worth saying that from a health and science perspective, and there's a very good report by um, the Big Data Institute in Oxford at Nuffield um, on why a centralized model is good for health reasons. It just gives you much more data on, um, on the health um, uh, of the nation and how the virus is spreading and where it's spreading. Um, so I, I, it's a very persuasive paper, uh, but the problem is um, it brings with it some, some really quite serious downsides. However, if it can be made to work, the benefits are pretty obvious. Um, human contact tracing is slow. It takes quite a long time. Uh, you have to rely on people to be contactable, to be, uh, to be receiving a phone call, then to go and get tested. I mean, it's not, um, it, it, it's, it's really not uh, working at a speed that we need it to do to in, a, in, a, in a pandemic of this sort. So for accuracy and speed, um, uh, an app looks like a good solution. It's not the only thing that needs to happen and the whole thing only works if there is um, testing on a large scale and rapid testing and that we've really struggled in the UK to achieve that frankly and we're still struggling. But I'll talk a little bit about the difference between the two, two models, centralized and decentralized in a moment. Um, but I think uh, to step back a second, what in order for this to work, as the Nuffield study shows, at least 60% of the country needs to be downloading this app, whether on Android or Apple, um, probably near 80%, which is, it, which is a tough um, target, although uh, the only public opinion poll I've seen on this suggests that people are open to it, in the UK at least, uh, to doing it for the period of the pandemic, uh, and think it will be worth it. The things that are likely to stop people doing it are partly, of course, privacy. If this is portrayed as the ultimate surveillance device, which will tell the government exactly who you've been in contact with and where uh, and at what time, then um, clearly people won't download it. But I think that is a, 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 an unfair exaggeration. Um, the government has done a good job in dispelling some of the privacy concerns, though some remain. Um, the bigger problem will be if it drains your battery, um, people won't download it. If it floods you with false positives, so you're being told to self-isolate every every 10 minutes, um, that's going to be a disincentive. So I think the technical problems here are bigger than the privacy ones, but let's discuss that because I know people have strong views on it. And it'll be interesting to hear from anyone who's actually downloaded and used it, particularly in Hong Kong uh, and Singapore. Which brings me nicely to the third of my three legs on uh, China. So um, when I was in uh, Wadham in uh, uh, September, I was talking particularly in the context of the debate about the use of Huawei technology, 5G telephony, which was very topical at the time. I was talking about the technology competition between uh, the US and China and the rise of China as a, um, as a technology superpower, uh, bluntly. Um, the fact that China has moved beyond basic manufacturing of uh, technology goods for the West to uh, being at the cutting edge of some research and development and in some technology areas to being world leading and with ambitions to become uh, world leading in things like artificial intelligence by 2030, very explicit ambitions. Um, 
And I think there is a deep dilemma for all of us in how do we cope with a country that is that advanced, uh, but that has values so uh, diametrically opposed to our own. It wasn't a problem we had to worry about in the Cold War because the Soviet Union's technology, except in some specific military areas, wasn't something we all hankered after. We didn't really want to buy the latest piece of Soviet uh, technology or Soviet tractors as the thing that they used to celebrate. But it wasn't something that the West hankered after, and certainly not at a consumer level uh, or at an infrastructure level. So this is a new problem. And I think um, what has changed is that China's bad behavior, frankly, um, the Communist Party's bad behavior, uh, Xi's more aggressive stance, um, has been borne out during the pandemic. So the pandemic has illustrated the Communist Party's uh, worst tendencies to suppress um, information and people uh, and uh, to control. And that is a, a rather stark reminder of, uh, of the difference in our values. And so it is leading everybody, and you may have seen Tony Blair's speech the other day on, on uh, how we recalibrate our, um, our, our three C's, if you like, the confrontation, containment, and cooperation with China. Uh, clearly, there are, is a strong um, move in Washington to move towards confrontation, uh, not necessarily uh, military, but, but confrontation in other ways, um, and a move away from the Kissinger doctrine that we've lived with for 40 years, um, that it was in our interest to draw China into the rules-based system. Um, uh, and one could argue that we have never really done that. We've drawn them in, but not actually uh, confronted them when they've, when they've ignored the rules. So there is a good argument to, to be made for uh, having, giving that another go. But I can see why people are uh, frustrated and giving up on that and, and have concluded that that will never happen. I have some sympathy with that. Uh, however, I think as we, we talked about in September, there are some areas uh, where cooperation um, looks like the only way to solve some of the world's problems, as well as being a, a morally uh, attractive um, solution. Uh, how, do we, how do we confront cl climate change? Uh, never mind technology, never mind the pandemic, but particularly climate change without cooperation with the, the second biggest superpower uh, in, in the world. Um, and I, I, I I have no answers, um, largely because I think there are no answers in the West at the moment. And the truth is that uh, whether or not the current US policy is right, and, and, and it is bipartisan, both parties are very much taking the same line on China. Um, the, the weakness and the strength of China is that there is total disunity in the West um, on everything from 5G to uh, broad approaches to China. And until there can be a convening power or leadership in the West in a single policy, the chances of actually um, uh, uh, implementing um, any coherent policy on China is, is very limited. Um, so on that slightly gloomy note, um, um, made more gloomy, I think, by the pandemic, uh, I'll bring this to a close because I think I'm out of time, but be delighted to have a discussion about any of those areas or others. Kind of. Okay, um, that was that was fascinating, Robert. Thank you. Can I can I just start off the discussion with a couple of questions? Um, the fir the first the first one really is, is about China. Um, I mean, we can all see what's happened um, so far as U.S. policy to China is concerned. As you say, people don't always notice, but it is it is pretty bipartisan. This increasing, I suppose, one might say, hostility to China and fear of what the rise of China represents if it's not challenged appropriately at some stage. I'm wondering though whether you think that the the pandemic has thrown things into sharp relief in Europe as well and we may be going to see a recalibration of the sort that Tony Blair was talking about in in European relations with China. I mean already the government is talking about rethinking Huawei for example. Um, I mean do you think we're going to see concrete policy changes of that sort over the next one, two, three, four years? I'm fairly sure we will see one on Huawei in the UK, which will have quite a knock-on effect because I think a lot of other countries have been resting on the UK's assessment of Huawei. Um, uh, uh, it won't be devastating for Huawei. They've sold heavily into the developing world and into Asia, uh, and that's been their strategy, but it will be a big blow. Um, I think politically it is now um, much easier for governments that were torn in both directions after the pandemic to uh, to take a harder line on China. And of course, given what China is doing in Hong Kong, it gets easier by the day. 
Um, so I think there will be a shift here, there already is. Um, across Europe, uh, Germany is the, is the bellwether, and there is strong pressure in Germany to change the policy of Huawei. Um, the US is also applying a lot of pressure. Uh, so I think um, it's heading in that direction, and the EU put out a document last year, which was much more skeptical about China, much more uh, balanced on the threats as well as the opportunities. Having said that, um, there are a lot of countries that have a lot of Chinese investment, including the UK and infrastructure, and are dependent on China to produce a lot of the goods that they need, including a PPE in the pandemic. So it's not going to be straightforward, but I think the mood is definitely changing, and I'm sure some of that will, will translate into policy changes. So those would be big moments. I mean, if, if the government shifted its policy on Huawei, that's, that's a big moment, isn't it? That's a significant it decision, uh, and it's a significant it's, harbinger of changes to come. Yeah, I think so. It's significant for the UK. Um, it's, it's quite challenging for the telco industry um, because uh, it's not completely clear what the what the alternatives are. Um, there are there are two European manufacturers, Ericsson and Nokia, but they're nowhere near as large um, uh, or have the capacity of of, of uh, Huawei and ZTE. Um, and all of this illustrates a huge market failure in the West. I think everybody agrees that whatever they feel about Huawei, so the US and the UK and everybody agrees. How do we let this happen? And are we? Are we is this going to happen? Lots of other technologies, which is the even more interesting question, which we yeah. explored back in September. So, um, uh, but it is a big moment to say, well, we're going to take the hit financially and maybe in terms of time to deliver 5G in yeah. order to move away from dependence on Huawei. Yeah. Okay. Can I encourage people to start raising their hands if they? Have questions, um, but in in the meantime, Robert, just to move to this question of centralized or decentralized apps, as you as you said, this is a question of of trust, um, and the idea has got out, and I, I I don't know the extent to which it's accurate that the the Google Apple solution, the decentralized solution, is much more protective of people's privacy than the centralized solution, um, and I'm wondering whether. I mean, that looks as though it's right. Is it right? Mm -hmm. I think it is right. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, for, for those who um, are unfamiliar with this, uh, the essential difference is, is where the data goes. So if you have a decentralized system uh, and you sign up to this app, you, you are given daily or whatever it is uh, in your phone um, a list of all the, the people who have reported symptoms um, of uh, a COVID and if you go within a certain distance of them and this is where the technology gets really really clever and, and frankly pretty difficult because getting close to someone you know, it can mean almost anything i mean if you're close to them but there's a piece of glass between you clearly that's very different from being close to them for 15 yeah. minutes so the technology problems for for the bluetooth application of actually measuring distance and length of time and um proximity in other ways uh, are, are not trivial but in short, the, 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 the decentralized version simply downloads to your phone uh, this huge list of people. If you locally bump into them, it tells you, and then you, need, you know you need to either go and, go and uh, uh, self-isolate or get tested, or you know, there are various policy things coming out of it. The problem with that, as the Nuffield study will, will sh show in great detail, um, is that it doesn't give the health authorities any information at all on the spread of the virus. And it's also probably less good at measuring the risk of being close to people. So there are, if you have loads of data, you can work out on a bus of 15 people, um, you know, how risky is it to be in touch with person X? Um, if they've been in touch with lots of other people, um, then it's, it's obviously riskier. Um, if they then turn out to be um, positive, uh, then the risk is borne out. Those sorts of things are not um, available in the decentralized model. The decentralized model essentially tells you uh, what to do, um, but it does protect your privacy uh, more clearly. Okay. I think on the, um, the, the the centralized model, it gives the public health authorities a better sense of um, who, how many people have the virus, and not exactly where they are. And it is worth saying that in the the NHS model, the only personal data collected is the first three letters of your postcode um, and the make of your phone. So there isn't a lot of personal data in there, but people will always argue it's possible to de-anonymize. Um, and uh, it is certainly true that the reason why Apple and Google don't support it, Apple especially, 
uh, is that they they think it is weaker on privacy yeah. um, and they will not allow uh, Bluetooth to run in the background that, in, in the way that um, uh, that it has to in the centralized model. So uh, personally, I think, um, and, and the public opinion polls seem to support this, that that's a price worth paying during the pandemic itself. If this thing works, um, then stopping people dying is uh, uh, a higher priority than I think fairly marginal um, infringement of your privacy. Uh, but there are some big questions about you know, what happens to this data. I think there needs to be great clarity that it's only available to public health authorities, not to advertisers, insurer, insurers, or anybody else. And we're all living with the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, we've got to be sure that that doesn't, doesn't happen to this sort of data. We've got to be uh, sure that the data is, um, is deleted at a certain point. Um, that's a debate with academia about when it ceases to be useful. But my, I think my overall point is that governments are bad at making decisions in a, in a crisis and there's a danger we end up with a new normal for health surveillance. So I would, I would support this only if at the end of the pandemic there is a very clear end to the project and a review and a parliamentary and public debate about it because it warrants that and we can't have that now. Yeah, okay. All right, I'm going to go to some questions. We've already got a, a list of people. Can I, can I repeat that if people want to ask questions rather than raise their hands physically because I've only got one page open in front of me. Could you use the blue hand uh, facility which you can find by clicking on participants at the bottom um, of the page? Right, the first question, when you, when you, when you ask a question, could you just um, tell us what subject you did and if you don't mind, <laughs> if it's not too embarrassing, your year of matriculation. Andrew Mitchell. Hi, I did the PPE and my year of matriculation was 77. Um, so picking up on Ken's question, Robert, which was, uh, uh, will there be a reorientation in European approach to China to follow the US um, shift? Uh, I suppose my question is perhaps unfairly to ask the question, uh, should there be a reorientation by Europe? And more importantly, bearing in mind your comment just now about governments making bad decisions in a crisis, what is the objective of such a reorientation? One might argue clearly in the US it's a political reorientation or is it something deeper and more profound? What are we seeking to achieve? Um, I, 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 there is clearly a lot of politics in this in an election year especially and my impression is that both sides of the house in, in Washington are, are taking the same tough line on China. There isn't a lot uh, between their policies. So I, I accept there's a lot of policy but I do think there's a more profound shift here. I think um, quite a bit of this is down to President Xi's um, change of direction, frankly. I mean, it's not that the Chinese Communist Party was ever uh, sort of soft and liberal, um, but uh, it, there has been a distinct change of direction since uh, the, the Congress or three years ago now, um, and his really quite aggressive speech um, about uh, um, not just the near abroad, but um, China's place in the world. and. Uh, I think the behavior towards Hong Kong is really worrying. Uh, it, it, it implies that they, they have decided that the decline of Hong Kong is a price worth paying um, for uh, security and control, presumably with an eye on Taiwan as well. I think their behavior towards Australia, when Australia called for an inquiry, pretty reasonable request for an inquiry into the pandemic. Um, their statement tonight even on uh, British policy on Hong Kong, where as you probably heard, we may extend um, the visa, visa um, access for uh, overseas citizens in Hong Kong. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it all feeds the idea that this is um, a resurgent Communist Party with um, some of the worst traits of a, an authoritarian regime. So I think that does warrant a change of, a, a change of direction in the West doesn't necessarily mean a complete reversal. And I think we probably do need to work out, you know, how do we confront China? And we can only do that as a, as a block. Um, and what do we want to achieve? Uh, but the problem is there seems to me to be no coherent policy um, in the UK actually, but certainly not in, in the West in general. And China has um, uh, pretty effectively picked off different countries in different ways, um, quite largely through investment. Um, and uh, I don't think that's going to change. So um, Western leadership is a bigger problem, I think, as 
Chinese behavior. Um, but the root of it is a, a change of direction in China, I think. I'm just going to ask a question which Bjorn Blendheim has asked um, on the chat function. I'll pick these up occasionally. Um, Bjorn says, much of the Chinese economic growth is driven by growth of debt and huge balance sheet expansion of their banks. Should we not expect this to catch up and weaken their position? That's a question for an economist, really, Robert. I wonder whether you've got... Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm absolutely not an economist, but it sounds... <laughs> <laughs> sounds about I'm right. Not lots of things, but that's about. But it sounds about right to me. Um, I mean, there must be a point at which this uh, Chinese ownership of uh, vast chunks of the world debt uh, becomes slightly meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, uh, that is into the realms of, of something I completely ignorant of, as okay. opposed to partially ignorant of. <laughs> okay. The next blue raised hand is Patrick Costello. Patrick. Patrick, are you there? You need to unmute. You need to unmute, Patrick, otherwise, oh yeah. Okay. I'm muted. I think I was being muted. Anyway, it's okay. done. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes, you just tell us who, when you, what, what subject you did. And Great, when you yes. Um, Patrick Costello, um, matriculated in 1983, um, started medicine and, and graduated in PP. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask a, a, a question in relation to this, this dilemma of centralized, decentralized apps, um, because I, 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 you know, I, I, I take on board what you're saying about the fact that if it's centralized, the data that, that, that's taken from this is going to be um, more useful in terms of prevention. Um, but I'm concerned that a lot, I mean, I work in, 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 in the European Union and I'm, I'm concerned that um, a lot of member states of the European Union are going for the decentralized model precisely mm -hmm. because they're worried about the use of data. And, and I'm additionally concerned about the fact that um, the, the company that's been contracted to, to, to produce this app was the company that did the data analytics for the vote no campaign in the Brexit referendum. Um, and, and at least what I, what I, what I see is that, that the data, at least some of the stories I'm reading suggest that the data will be kept for a certain period. So I'm kind of looking for reassurance on this because, because it does look rather, rather worrying. <laughs> Um, well, I, I absolutely don't speak for the government, so it's hard for me to reassure, um, I, <laughs> except to say that, um, you know, I think I, I, mean, I, I share some of your concerns. I mean, I think if you look at the Nuffield tale, the Big Data Institute paper, um, and of course the problem is that big data people, academics, intelligence officers will always want more data. So if you offer them more data, they'll always say more is better. Um, but they nonetheless make a pretty good case for saying that the centralized um, uh, data model will be more accurate, it will be faster, the risk modeling around um, you know, who, who you've been in contact with will be much, much better, um, and therefore it's more, not only more effective, uh, effective uh, in, in combating the, the virus, but it's also more likely to be used because people will trust it. Um, and it's better at managing local outbreaks because there's more aggregated data to work out where they are. Um, having said that, I uh, and it is worth saying that the personal data involved is pretty minimal. Um, however, um, I think you can also make a case for saying that at any point that can be um, de-anonymized. Um, we've seen plenty of examples of that in the past. So uh, I, I think it is a key question of uh, who gets to use this. Um, so it should not be used by any, uh, anybody other than a health authority. And that needs to be pretty clearly defined. The government has given that assurance, but I haven't yet seen a list of who can use it. The temptation of every government body to want to use this, uh, yeah, yeah, for the best of intentions, but you know, you know police and um, safety and you, you name it, immigration, anybody could pile in and say, we want access to this. Ken will be very familiar with this debate um, on, on big data from, from his time. Um, so I think we absolutely need to resist that. We also need to have a clear end point to this. Um, I, I would personally like to see all the data deleted, uh, though an academic has sort of pointed out to me that that would be a, a yeah, that would be an awful waste for health um, academics. So, I, um, but somebody needs to debate these questions. I mean, the problem is we haven't got time to at the moment. So uh, I share your concerns, and I think the answer is to to go for what looks to me a, actually they've taken a lot of uh, very sensible steps on privacy. There's a very good blog actually by 
uh, uh, a former GCH for his, no, not, not former, his, uh, GCHQ guy called Ian Levy on the NCSC website, which talks about privacy and the measures they've taken. Uh, it's definitely worth a look. Um, but I think the whole thing should be clearly wound up and there should be a big debate because uh, um, going back to China, you know, China has introduced these sort of um, permanent health surveillance apps um, and they're compulsory. Uh, we absolutely don't want to drift into that by accident. So there, there should be an end, end to this project and then a, a, an open public debate about it. I mean, that's, that's the horror show, isn't it? The, the Chinese social credit system, which is... Yeah. The, the kind of most extreme version of, of what you're you're describing here. Um, Lucy Huberman. Hi, I was at Wadham reading history in French and I matriculated in 1982. So I did want to debate a bit about the relationship between the human to human contact tracing, which has been practiced for decades, if not hundreds of years, and the app. Um, I think the public debate needs to happen before the app, not after the app. Um, um, the contact tracing is actually not that difficult and not that time constraint, not that doesn't take up that much time if you have enough people to do it. And um, Professor Alison Pollock, who's on the Independent Sage Committee, has spoken most sort of convincingly about this over the last, I would say, 10 weeks. So um, we are own infrastructure with GPs in primary care who are the people who know, who know people in the local community the best and on the whole local people trust their GPs. Uh, in local authorities we have public health officials, environmental health officials, I mean much diminished by austerity but there is a big infrastructure and 750,000 people of which I'm one volunteer to be NHS responders and Dr. Professor Pollock argues that they could be trained to contact trace within two to three days if up to a week max. Now that's all probably too late for all of that. Serco has been appointed and or Deloitte's through with all sorts of connections to the government that probably don't want to debate now um, but they, 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 it has been outed, quite a lot of it's been outed in the press um, there has never been a government circo project that I'm aware of. I'm professor of digital media and innovation that hasn't had data breaches. Um, so I think in, in terms of talking about take up of the apps, one or the other, and behavior by the public, I mean, the public's quite wise now, if it can be bothered. I think um, uh, what is a trusted app? You know, I don't know. What is a trusted app? There's, there's privacy issues with all apps with Google, with Facebook, with, with a lot of it. Um, and with Zoom, and with Zoom. And with Zoom, although they've taken some measures, you know, because of mm. public outcry. So in terms of behavior, I suppose, and then there was the trial on the Isle of Wight. I mean, I cannot think of a worse place to conduct a trial <laughs> of this kind. I'm sorry, if you're into sort of design of trials, you wouldn't choose a closed population of senior people who don't go out much anyway. We you might just, have some of them on the call. Sorry. I don't, mind, them I don't mind because they said something very sensible. <laughs> they said something very sensible. They said, we think we would use an app, but only in secondary position to an attempt of discussion with local uh, GPs or whatever. And I think if, um, I'm sorry, I'm quoting Independent Sage quite a lot, but at least it's all out in the public domain. If you think of the pandemic as a explosion, like a huge firework, um, and we've seen the explosion and the sort of embers of the firework are all over the place. And we're now, all you can say about a pandemic now is a series of small, of local outbreaks. You don't, you know, in the UK, you don't, when you call 999 to, to deal with your outbreak, get an, uh, a fire truck from Westminster. You get it from your local fire rescue station. So, I think decentralization has an enormous amount going for it in the collection of data. So I think the debate is, what I'm understanding about the debate is for data scientists and academics, I think they would prefer to have the centralized app because they will get bigger data sets. But in terms of putting out the local embers and the public take up, my feeling is the sort of decentralized approach, whether it's by humans or the app, we'll, okay. see, we'll see more take up. 
what, and I don't know what my question is. What do you think? Well, I think I think, well, I, think that's, I think that's a very fair point, and a lot of people I think a lot of people feel that. Robert, what's your what's your response well, to that? Actually, I don't disagree at all, really. And I think uh, I originally supported the decentralised largely because I thought it was more likely to work. And back to yeah. your your circo point. I mean, as something that is backed by Apple and Google, who are quite good at apps, however much we may worry about the uh, the privacy of them. Um, uh, is more likely to work than something that has never been done before, uh, created by government in, in breakneck uh, speed. So um, that was my main worry. I, I think right, right through this pandemic, governments always and just illustrate this desire to centralize everything and pull all the levers from Whitehall. And as we've seen with testing uh, and with all sorts of other things, um, it's often better to use existing local mechanisms wherever you can. And build on those and so I, I, I sort of agree with you. Um, I do take seriously the data science point that you know the, 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 the Nuffield paper I think is quite persuasive that it would be better if there was data to go on centrally but I, I agree I think actually the priority is to, to stamp out local um, uh, local outbreaks and a localized app would do for that which is what the Germans have concluded but the whole thing only really works I mean it's only a part of the picture as you say and it only really works as a secondary instrument if testing um, is there and one of the problems is I think one of the reasons they built up the app and they now sort of rather played it down um, is because of the problems over, over testing um, the app is self-reporting so it was really an attempt to get around the absence of testing and get people to try and diagnose themselves uh, which is not without value I think um, I'm not an epidemiologist but it's it's not as good as a testing regime as in South Korea where they've had both of course they've had the app has been yeah, significant. I don't think a game changer, but the game changer has been testing. I think if the centralised app is a significant battery drain, people won't use it, Robert. That's I think right, that would be a really powerful reason why people won't use an app. If it drains their batteries, they're not going to use it. Well, they say they've sold that um, in the Isle of Wight trial, but I, I haven't seen any technical uh, evidence for that. Um, I think also the other reason people won't use it is, uh, apart from privacy concerns, is, is if they think it's if, it, if it starts flooding them with clearly false positives for yeah yeah okay um Thea Blackwell uh, good evening everyone um uh, Theo Blackwell I'm matriculated in modern history 1991 uh I'm the chief digital officer of London I work for the mayor of London so I've been doing a little bit of sort of on the ground observation of this uh debate and I just saw two observations really um one is the app is at sort of one end of a potential suite of emerging technologies which will pop up probably in your workplace so, uh, so perhaps unlike china where the state will be involved in things you can quite quickly imagine a situation where you walk into the lobby of a business and there'll be some heat sensing technology or like in other countries you're required to check in or people or businesses or landowners will require you to check in with QR codes and such like. So I think there is a, the app starts quite, uh, because of necessity, starts quite a big debate about a wider suite of emerging technologies. The data from which will not be, as it were, held by government, but may well be held by other actors. Um, so I think that's an issue that Parliament will have to start to tackle uh, and perhaps new legislation needs to be put in place. Second observation, very quickly, is that the crisis has really produced an appetite within, well, a realization, I hope, in the government that they didn't really have access to real time or close to real time data as much as they thought they would. The UK data system is extremely federated. The government has been mulling a, a national data strategy for over two years now. And so we are developing these devices in a context with a government that hasn't actually set the strategic policy framework. And yes, it's driven by need. OK, Robert, do you have observations on that? No, I, I mean, I agree. And I think on the first point, especially, there are all sorts of potentially alarming uses of not necessarily this app, but uh, other technologies. Um, uh, and we need a debate before they're introduced rather than them sort of drifting into the workplace and discriminating against particular groups which they clearly will um, so 
it's best to have that debate before rather than after. I think the, the pandemic specific app you could make an exception for in the crisis as long as it's then paused afterwards. Yeah. Okay. But I agree with your second point as well. Simon Landau. Hi, hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can. Yep. Um, so I uh, matriculated a long time ago in 1970. Uh, I studied law and then had a career in IT for most of my life. Uh, and that career was a constant reminder of the limitations of technology when it rubs up against human behavior. So it's in that context. I've had a mental model since about the year 2000 when I attended a conference on e-commerce, which posited some research from the States that said that all the sharing of personal data required for e-commerce was uh, perfectly possible up to the point where individuals reached the tipping point where they thought their security was now being violated. And at that same conference, we had a demonstration of what technology using uh, mobile phones to do proximity marketing, uh, what Robert called walking past the pizzeria and being notified there's a two for one offer there. Now the WAP experiment never took off for all the reasons that we've been discussing battery drain was the biggest and secondly people just didn't like their alarms going off every time they walked past the pizzeria but the privacy point um, that mental model um, has eroded over time to the point of subsidence now because we went past Cambridge Analytica we've been through all the uh, cyber intrusions uh, hacking of bank accounts, etc., and it hasn't stopped people's enthusiasm for sharing this data. Uh, so, I guess my question to Robert is: Is are the Chinese, in particular, and other technologically savvy uh, potential actors in this sphere, betting on our privacy never reaching that tipping point? Our privacy concerns never reaching that yeah, good tipping question. point. Good question. I think it's, it is a, a great question. I, I think um, it, it's interesting that in Europe, of course, there are very different feelings about this. And, and one of the reasons the EU has been very strong on what well, comes to introduce GDPR and their whole concept of owning, ownership of data, of your personal data, um, but very strong in taking on the big tech companies uh, in, in, on the west coast of the US. Um, is because they do see it differently over there and the public opinion polling is, is quite uh, noticeably different uh, in, in mainland Europe from, from in the UK. People are um, demanding um, their governments and the EU more broadly um, put, put restrictions on this, which is interesting to see whether they're successful or not is another, uh, another matter. And I think one of, the, one of the interesting things coming out of the pandemic is that the tech industry is massively emboldened and enriched actually so these companies are more powerful than they were before the pandemic it will be very interesting to see whether the eu continues to pursue them in the same way and to confront them in the way that they've been promising to um, but the only block in the world that i'm aware of that's prepared to take on um, those companies and countries like china on data privacy is is the eu um, so that is that is the best hope but i share your i mean it, i think the general public i don't think it's it's just that they don't care it's very often quite difficult to understand the depth and, and scale of data about you that has been collected and held and one of the things cambridge analytica showed was just how complex it is um it isn't simply what you've handed over because you don't really realize what you've handed over and you certainly don't realize the third party handing over that's gone on so there's partly an education issue but I, I kind of agree that the basic contract of free services in return for uh, handing over your data is one that people still quite like. And this may be partly a generational thing as well. That, mm. Mm. Um, it may be that younger people who have grown up with it are, uh, are more used to it. Um, I mean, while we're talking about 
about trust. I think Duncan Enright's got a question about localism and trust, which may be pertinent at this point. Um, Duncan. Well, that's an interesting way of framing it as well about trust. So I would say this because I'm a local councillor, but it seems to me that in the UK, but also in the world, um, the response to the pandemic has been most effective where you have local government um, taking a lead. Germany has a sort of famously capable um, federal structure and, and localism is alive in, um, in France. It got away from them initially, but it seems to me again that local government has played the big role in sort of controlling things. So if you're doing test and trace, for instance, if the test is done locally, they will know where set up the test stations uh, when they're tracing contacts they will be able to say oh uh, did you go to little during this period or they will know the patch and be able to have a much more effective response i, I feel that that in the uk we are underpowered and under resourced but in nevertheless um volunteering support has come from the local level and the nhs volunteers hasn't been so great um the uh, response in terms of meeting the need of those shielding has come from local government and national government has responded by providing extra resources. Robert, I wondered whether you thought there was any kind of lasting resettlement or, or, or rebalancing of power which might come out of this. And, and is it true or is it just my perception, my biased perception as a councillor, that the countries that have a better local government infrastructure seem to have responded better? Well, I think it's uh, really interesting, Duncan. I mean, I, I, I hope uh, they're going to be, if there is, whether there's not an inquiry uh, or not, there is one. I mean, I think there are so many lessons to learn from this. And um, I think the local, the local delivery of services is, um, is a, a key one to come out of this. And I hope it will be. Uh, it, just seeing this tendency that you always get in Whitehall to do everything from the centre, um, sort of the perfect being the enemy of the good. So we'll create this whole new industry and it'll be brilliant. But actually government struggles to deliver anything on that scale and it takes a long time um, so it does feel that ideology really on, on actually in both major parties in the last 10 years to centralize stuff uh, in in Whitehall and not to use and delegate to local government has probably counted against us um, I don't know about I don't know enough about um, foreign comparisons but on the list you gave it does it does look like um, uh, it's true that in, where you've got effective local understanding and local machinery, it works better. But that, that's probably a hunch more than a okay. um, evidence-based. Bryn, Bryn Harris. Oh, uh, Bryn Harris, I did a DFIL in Classics, matriculated 2004. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for such an interesting uh, talk. My question largely follows on really from the one that James Landau asked. Um, it's only been uh, a fairly short amount of time since data privacy has been a fundamental right in its own right. And um, it seems to me that the contact tracing apps uh, are gonna be quite a big challenge um, or a, an open question as to, um, what sort of weight the public put on that weight, uh, sorry, put, put on that right, i.e. that there's, there's a dilemma between protecting our privacy rights uh, and on the other hand, protecting public health. And it seems to me an open question as to which way the public uh, might go. Obviously, there are some funda fundamental rights where, uh, you know, it's fairly predictable that people might accept a lower level of security, for instance, uh, if it means protecting certain rights, such as uh, the, the human right against torture. So uh, it seems to me a completely open question as to um, whether people will insist on their privacy rights, even if it means uh, a reduction in public health protections. But I was just wondering, Robert, if, if you have any, any sort of inkling or instinct um, as to how the public might, might look at this and, and whether they will cling to their data privacy right or, or whether they'll in a sense downgrade it uh, in the face of a public health emergency well the only polling i've seen on this is uh, at, at the end of the nuffield report actually and they say um it doesn't say what sample this was but a, 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 a poll was done and results suggest i've got them in front of me actually 66 
percent of participants said they would or definitely or probably uh, download the app. Eighty four percent said they'd be willing to share their COVID data with the NHS, which I think is an interesting point. It shows people trust the NHS, um, whatever that may mean. I mean, they may not be clear about what the NHS is, but it goes to a point made earlier about people trust their GPs and their local their local health infrastructure. Um, but uh, and over half of people um, favoured um, controlling the pandemic over privacy, but only just over half, or fifty-four percent. So I think it will depend really on on um, the debate around this and how uh, worried people get about the privacy. Um, but I think you know government could do quite a lot to see that off by saying it will be time limited, by by setting out the restrictions on it, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, some of that's in their control. And I think with that, people probably would live with it if the benefits, I mean, my bigger worry is this may not actually work um, and there may not be many benefits from it and it, it won't help the, the uh, unlocking the lockdown, which is the, the key here is to try to control local outbreaks and to allow people to lead a normal life. And particularly we were hearing about London earlier, you know, to allow people to go into a big city with some sort of, it's all partly about reassurance, I suppose, that having this thing will, have, will help them a bit. Um, but uh, if none of that really works, then privacy is kind of going to be almost irrelevant. Yeah. Um, Lynn Haming. Lynn, are you there? But I'm not being, oh, there I am. <laughs> I hear me now. Took a while. I'm yeah. in Germany. It obviously took a while to get across. Um, two points. One is that you mentioned you weren't quite sure how other countries are dealing with this. Um, I can tell you that in Germany locally, if we go to a restaurant, if we go to church, you have to fill out your name, address, telephone number, and then you'd be contacted if there's any problems. That's a very simple solution. And um, we have to trust then the people, you don't go to church or you don't go to a particular restaurant if you don't trust people that they're going to keep your address and telephone number carefully for four weeks and then they're going to tear it up. The second thing is the app that's going to be developed, is it going to just work in England? because once the borders are open again and people can travel back and forth, you'll have people from other countries and that might be where the infection comes from and you wouldn't necessarily have any data on that. I think that second point is very important. I mean, if you particularly take Northern Ireland, uh, the Irish public is going for a, a decentralized um, model and the North obviously is going for a centralized, it's classic, you couldn't really make it up. Um, but it means if you travel you know, a few miles across the border, you're going to have a, an app that won't it really won't talk to the to the other app um and uh yeah it would be so much easier if everybody went for something that was at least compatible um, but i i can't see that happening at the moment um so the chances of you I and mean, there was talk in the past of using this as a sort of kind of health passport um which had downsides of its own actually but uh, i don't think that's going to be remotely possible the app itself won't be anyway, just because for the reasons you say um so it is another another reason why it's going to be best used locally, frankly. Okay. Uh, Naomi Osorio. <laughs> Naomi. Yes, hello. Um, uh, PPE is as a second degree from um, 2005. <laughs> and I now work as a philosopher back at the University of Vienna. Welcome. Um, we've just started working at the university again. Um, rules in Vienna are that we have to have um, 10 square meters per room for, for researchers to be able to share a room. Um, it has to be 20 square meters minimum for two people in a room, things like that. And the students aren't back yet. Um, now in Austria, um, the government got the Red Cross to, I'm not sure whether develop, probably just um, promote Oh, Naomi's unfortunately frozen. Naomi, could you switch off your video because we've lost your sound? Oh dear, I think we've lost Naomi. We've lost her connection, Ken. Okay, all right. Well, we'll come back to Naomi if we can if we can reach her again. Um, um, Michael Oliver. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Michael. Thank you. Uh, so in 1967, uh, I did chemistry uh, and then went into medicine. Uh, my question is, is 
is swimming against the tide of the last questions. That is, it returns to China, if that's okay. Um, well, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I was interested to know about Robert's view about other areas of technological intercourse, if you like, between us and China, and how, how extensive are those vulnerabilities? Um, um, the obvious one, I suppose, is the nuclear industry. Uh, and of course, there is one, 5G presented a slightly easier problem in the sense that it hasn't been built yet. Um, and I suspect that there are a number of techno technological areas where Robert is worried about vis-a-vis uh, -vis a malign China, um, where disentangling the technologies might be much more difficult. Well, that's interesting. It's very interesting. I mean, I think oh, 5G is an interesting example in the UK. And there are lots of countries where it hasn't been built yet in the sense it's going to be a greenfield, a whole new 5G system. Um, the problem in the UK is that 5G is going to be built on top of 4G infrastructure, mostly belonging to BT, which is full of Huawei already. So I think already the government has hinted it when it, when it changes its policy, it won't insist that BT rip, rips out um, Huawei from 3G and 4G, but it will presumably say it wants um, a very small percentage or no Huawei in 5G, which is not straightforward because, well, for technical reasons, and I'm not an expert on, on a future teleco, teleco networks, but uh, I'm told it's quite difficult to do if you're, if you're going to build somebody else's technology on top of existing infrastructure. But that's one for them to solve. Um, on your real question about other technologies, well, well Xi has been very, um, very explicit that um, on a couple of big things. One is that China should become self-sufficient on semiconductors, on chips by, I think he said 2025. Um, uh, I think that's, everybody agrees that's unlikely to happen, but they are racing towards independence from the US and from the West. And uh, if you look at a Huawei phone today, um, uh, the percentage of US um, uh, technology in it is, is probably in single figures or not much above. Uh, even five years ago, it was probably 60, 70%. I mean, there are no exact um, figures on this, but it, it's a huge reduction. And they've been racing to get in silicon independence, as it's called. And I don't think they will be as advanced as some areas of the US in this, uh, but they're, you know, they're, they're going to be pretty good. And that's partly politically driven to, to want to be free of the West. But um, the real areas, I think, of, of worry are artificial intelligence, where China has said it wants to be a world leader by 2030. Um, and people who know about this say it probably will be a world leader in some areas, not in all areas of AI. It has the tremendous example of having almost um, limitless access to data uh, for all the reasons we've been discussing in the last hour, actually, that they don't really worry about privacy. Um, and they don't have to worry about constraints on uh, the use of their, of their citizen data. That actually gives you quite a big leg up in, in developing um, AI. So um, that's the, I think that's the most obvious AI and robotics, which is where a lot of the investment is going and frankly, where some of the uh, theft of intellectual property has, has been. Um, but the reason why I think 5G is interesting is, is, is because it's just one example of um, a much, much bigger problem. And if, we've, if the market failure in the West was this severe on 5G, what's to stop us? You know, how do we stop making these mistakes? How do we identify the things where we, we absolutely want a, a Western um, uh, equivalent? Um, and how do we fund it um, and incentivize the, the market in the West to, to do it? Because we haven't been very good at that, frankly. And in one sense, it, it occurred to me in one, in one sense, this, this idea that the, the power blocks industries would be entirely independent of each other and non-dependent on each other is, is quite sinister. I mean, if you, if you look at the history of peace in Europe since the Second World War, it's precisely by meshing the, I mean, the, the precursor of the European Union was the iron and, the, uh, iron and coal ag agreement between France uh, and Germany. The idea was that your industries became so entwined that you could never fight a war. And that, that, yeah. was, a kind of, f that was the first building block of the European Union. And what's happening with the power, power blocks now is that they're, they're withdrawing from that idea and they're, they're wanting to become completely independent of each other. And that, I think that's, that's, a, problems, that, that's very, um, uh, we had a brief chat about this in September, I think, in that um, 
technology is, is a sort of symbol for the pulling apart of the, the two sides. And, and there are people talking about, we will build a sort of uh, technology wall around China and make it yeah. its own ecosystem and not. Uh, and I think you know, it has, that has to be bad for um, uh, the world as a whole, for all the reasons you've said, but also the fact that if you look back over the last 50 years, um, you know, technology progress uh, and development progress so has has come from a pretty good partnership between East and West, actually, um, which has benefited both sides. That's what's pulling apart. And you know, the most extreme and obvious example is some sort of different operating systems, literally. So if Huawei phones are not allowed to carry Google, uh, you know, Google search and Gmail and uh, YouTube, um, well, people won't stop buying them in China. So they may stop buying them elsewhere. So you will get um, increasingly get two totally different systems, which yeah. which can't be good for international understanding. Exactly. I'm just going to go back. We're going to have to draw this to a close because it's 7:15. There are a few people, I'm afraid, who's we're not. And we're just not going to get to. But we've got Naomi back, so I think we should hear the the rest of Naomi's question. If you could ask it quite briefly, Naomi. Let's see if we can hear you now. Very sorry, my my connection crashed. Okay. If you um, could come, to, if you could come to a question quite quickly, because we're really running. Yes. Yeah, so um, the the question is, I uh, I had the feeling that many people consider COVID to be something like a relatively moderate test run for a vi virus that could be much much worse. Um, and the question is then, once we've got an app that is now being developed and that is going to be tested on COVID. Uh, we'll be stuck with it for good. So um, how to how to balance um, or what, 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 what the what the plans are in terms of uh, whether an app that is now being introduced is going to be there for good. Well, I, I, it's very interesting and perhaps a good way to, way to end in that I remember back in 2008 the government published a national risk register for the first time. It's done it every year since and every single year since 2008 pandemic has been in the top right hand corner of the graph so maximum impact biggest problem for the nation and quite high likelihood um but uh yeah, it's very hard it goes back to the china point it's hard for western governments to um to think in more than four year cycles or even four years and it's clear that planning hadn't been done by successive governments so it's not a party point uh, for pandemic it, i i think it will change approaches to risk in the future um i, I hope so anyway uh, whether it relates to the app, I mean, um, I don't think it should drift into being a future pandemic app without a good debate. And that point made, I think, earlier by, by um, um, one of the other alumni was, you know, we, we need to have that debate first. Yeah. Um, but it could have some really powerful, if we're going to get a lot of pandemics, and as you say, some might be much worse in their impact. Um, if this turns out to be a useful way of helping track and trace, helping humans do it, um, then, then why not? But um, let's have the debate first, I suppose. I'm just going to take. Two, I'm just going to take two more, if you don't mind, and they'll, they'll be quite yep. short. One from the chat, and one from Jonathan Rowe, who's had his hand up for a long time. Um, others, I'm afraid, we're not going to get to. I'm afraid the, the, the one from the chat is this from Jeremy Burnett Ray. He says, um, "This is one for you, definitely, Robert." He says, "Aren't we being a bit naive? I always assumed that GCHQ are tracking, bugging anyone, anyone they want to, anyway." Um, oh, but I can say I can say I, my experience is DPP was that that's certainly is true. But you might you might have your own views on it. Yeah, Ken, sorry, because I'm and <laughs> very appropriately my Bluetooth uh, <laughs> uh, headphones gave up. Say it again. So it's something about GCHQ. Aren't we being a bit naive? I always assume that GCHQ are tracking, bugging any way they want to, anyway. <laughs> yes, well, it's. Uh, I'm afraid that it isn't true, uh, as you all know, Ken. Um, you know, what GCHQ can do is very limited in the law. I mean, it's, it's focused on some very high-end threats. And frankly, even if, uh, uh, even if it was given the power to do it, um, it wouldn't have the capacity to do it on this scale. And, it, and it, of course, it's a foreign-facing organisation. It, it's not about uh, surveillance in the UK anyway. Uh, but I would think the same would be true for MI5. I think they've got enough on their plate, even if the law allowed them. Um, in, in worrying about terrorism and uh, uh, and foreign interference um, to uh, to worry about uh, health and also it's not really an area of expertise. Okay, yeah. Um, no, I, I said I think when you were changing your earphones, I said my experience as DPP was that that wasn't the case. Um, 
But it's a good point that these things need overseeing. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I do think this app needs properly overseeing. Yeah, and and why and there needs to be debate. There needs to be statute, um, and the, the statute needs to be clear to. I mean, that's why it's why Ripper, the Regulation Investigatory Powers Act, needed up dating because it frankly was a statute that nobody understood. And I don't think no, the agency I think it was designed not to be understood. Actually, well, I, I don't think anyone understood it. Um, the situation is is a lot clearer now. Um, I think this will have to be the last one. And Jonathan, we're we're pretty short. We're, we're running pretty late. So could you could you make your question? Um, or your contribution short and pithy, if you don't mind. 73, chemistry, banking. Um, my concern is that we have, are rapidly using up all of the goodwill of the public. I'm seeing locally an increasing disregard for social distancing. Um, and, and absent a really, really positive uh, effect from an app or whatever to encourage me to use it, I'm just, I'm suspecting that people won't bother. Hughes? Uh, I'm sure you're right, actually. I mean, <laughs> I think people need, need to be given a reason to use it. So if it's going to stop the, clearly stop the spread, help control in local areas, help the contact tracers, and therefore uh, save lives, but also help you um, get out of lockdown uh, and not have the entire country locked down um, when it doesn't need to be, and, and it could be localized, then people people will use it. But I agree that apathy or, or just sort of um, a lack of trust um, is likely to be the biggest uh, problem for this app. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. And I think we, um, we're going to have to draw to a close there. I, I want to thank you, Robert, um, for that, um, for both for your, your, your remarks and for answering all of those questions. It's been really fascinating.